You know, it's, it's interesting to consider the things that we forget and the things that we remember, right? We, we tend to forget the things we'd like to remember, and we tend to remember the things we'd like to forget, right? You know, as we talk about remembering, um, before we dive into our passage this morning and continue in our series and mo- talking about Moses, we're, we're going to stop and we're going to remember the sacrifice of Christ. Because if there's ever anything we do not want to forget, it's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you're a follower of Christ, there's no more important day in your life than the day you gave your life to Christ. And so as we have this opportunity to dive in God's word before we do that, we are going to pause and we are going to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're going to stop and we're going to remember that God loved us so much that he was willing to send his son and that the son was willing to go through with the father's will on our behalf. Because without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we're not here. This church isn't here. Without the death of Christ, we don't even want to go there, do we? And so we're going to stop and remember. In fact, even as we take a look at communion in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul tells us what took place on the final night of the life of Christ before he went to the cross. And twice, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And so we're going to take this time now and have communion. If, if you're a follower of Christ, and you haven't already grabbed uh, the cups that are out in the lobby, we would encourage you, you can just slip out right now and go grab those. I'm sure, I'm sure there's some people that would be willing to help you. But uh, we're going to take that moment and we're going to remember the sacrifice of Christ. If you're not a follower of Christ, this, this is not for you. Um, th- this is only for those who are followers of Christ because uh, the Bible makes it clear that, uh, that only those who are followers of Christ are supposed to partake in communion. And even with that, those who are followers of Christ need to make sure that they take communion um, in a worthy manner. And so you have to take a look at your own heart and your own life and what's taking place in your life. And maybe there's maybe there's some sin in your life that you need to deal with it. And and in a sense, this might be a time to do that. And in another sense, maybe you just just need to just to pass this time on taking communion. Only you know that. And only you know what the Spirit is laying on your heart. But as we consider communion, we remember the final final night of the life of Christ as He went to the cross, before He went to the cross, and He had the Passover meal with His disciples. And He says, it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when He was betrayed, He took bread. He took bread because the bread was going to represent his body that was about to be broken. He was about to be beaten so badly that you couldn't recognize him. And so Paul makes it clear of what took place on that night. That they took bread. And it says that when He broke it. They they had given thanks. Let's take a moment and let's stop and let's give thanks to the Lord. God, as as we come before you, we we just sang about power in the blood, about our incredible God seated on the throne, about the man of sorrows, rugged cross, our salvation. God, as we consider those words that just came out of our mouths as we sang them, we stop and we say thank you for the cross. We are not worthy. There's nothing in us and of us that would ever make us worthy except for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so we come humbly before you 
We come humbly saying thank you, God, for sending your son. And we're so grateful for the willingness of the son to go to the cross. So as we remember now, we don't do it out of habit once a month or so just because that's what we do. We, we do it because you call us to remember. And may we never forget the sacrifice of Christ. God, I, I just, as we come before you now, I pray for those that are struggling, that are hurting, that they would remember if they're followers of Christ, the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. For those who are not followers of Christ that are with us today, they might think some things are pretty confusing so far, but I pray that they would recognize that their only hope they could ever have is through Christ. I pray that they would recognize their need for salvation and that your spirit would draw them to yourself. God, as we come before you, we say thank you. And we remember what you've done for us. We remember the sacrifice of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. On that final night of the life of Christ, so that when he had given thanks, that he broke the bread and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the cracker in remembrance of the broken body of Christ. It goes on to say this, that in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup in remembrance of the blood of Christ. As I already mentioned, we, we tend to forget some things, remember others. It, it is so critical that we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that we stop and that we reflect on what Christ did for us in paying for our sin. And I hope it's something that we never forget. You know, there's other things that, that, like I said, we wish we forget, could forget. Yesterday, I, I, went, I went to Lowe's, and, and I, long story short, I ended up feeling pretty get, bad for the guy that was working there. But uh, I went to, to buy some paint, and as I went one way and Candace went another way, she went to the paint counter, and by the time I got there, the gentleman who was at the paint counter, he's going through this long description of the difference between the quartz and the gallons and how the lids are so much better on the quartz and how they stick so much better. You can guess right where this is going. And uh, he's going into all kinds of detail how he can hear it snap with the, with the court lid, but he can't hear it snap closed with the gallon lid. We got a, a quart of paint, and um, as we got up, I, I went to one of the self-checkouts there, and, and I had to take that quart of paint, and the sticker was on the side, and I took it and turned it sideways, and didn't that lid come off? <laughs> And, and I jumped back, paint's running down my arm, and it's, and it's all over the floor. And this guy came over, and he felt terrible. Like, I, I felt bad for him. Like, I wanted to kind of run with it a little bit, but I didn't. Because I, I felt so bad for the guy. You know, the one lady came over, she's like, you didn't get any on your clothes. And I was wearing these beat-up clothes, and I'm like, these clothes are brand new when I walked in the store. <laughs> we, she laughed. She knew I was messing around, but... The guy said, he's like, here I was just telling you guys about, the, he's like, I can't believe, he's like, I know what I did, I forgot after I did the sample, and I, I'm like, you know what, don't even worry about it. But I thought, man, that guy went home thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> he'd love to forget that moment. We all have moments like that in life, don't we, where there's things that take place and we're like, oh, I can't believe I just did that. And then there's other things that take place in life that, boy, we need to remember, Coming up in a month will be 20 years since 9-11-2001.
And when that took place, afterwards there was bumper stickers on all kinds of vehicles that said, we will never forget. And I think we have. I think we've kind of forgotten. I don't know what, what, you, what your experience was with 9-11, and I, I know that for me, um, believe it or not, we didn't have any kids then, <laughs> but we were a few months from Caleb being born, and, and I remember that just going through my mind and wondering where's the world going and what's going to happen and what's going to take place. I remember, I remember really clearly that there was prayer meetings. We lived in Binghamton at the time, prayer meetings that, that just got organized like quickly and all over the place and, 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 uh, and it, it, different churches and it, it didn't even have to be Wednesday night that the prayer meeting took place on. Like, it, but our nation was drawn together in recognition of its deep need for God. People loved police officers. In fact, I remember a friend of mine at the time who was a police officer in Binghamton. He said, Ben, he said, I've never experienced anything like this. He said, I went, went into one of the most dangerous parts of the city, and he said, there was people on their porches clapping as I drove by. It's like people that I've arrested before. <laughs> we, we've forgotten, haven't we? We're going to talk this morning about remembering and not forgetting. And we're going to look at a specific example in the book of Exodus as we continue in this series, looking at, at Moses as a leader, some of the character traits, and just some of the lessons that we can learn from the people of Israel. But today as we look at this study in the life of Moses, we're going to see how Israel forgets. They don't forget something inconsequential, but Israel forgot the miracles that God had performed on their behalf. Specifically, we're going to take a look at how the people of Israel forgot about the amazing works that God did in Egypt, how they forgot about the Red Sea, and we're going to see how their forgetfulness led to their sinfulness. Turn with me, if you haven't already, to Exodus chapter 32. It's on page 41 if you're using one of the Bibles under the chairs around you. The story in Exodus 32 is the story of the golden calf, and if you don't know much about it, you will by the time we're done. But before we can jump into the story, I want to I catch you up from, from last week we were talking about um, crossing the Red Sea, and I, I want to just walk through what takes place there because it's important for you to understand. After the people cross the Red Sea, all right, they, they go through on dry ground, walls of water either side of them. Um, in Exodus chapter 15, you have them celebrating God's victorious deliverance, and you see the song of Moses, of Miriam there. In Exodus chapter 16, God provides manna, gives them something to eat. In, in uh, chapter 17, uh, he gives them water from the rock. In chapter 18, Moses' father-in-law gives, Jethro gives um, Moses some much, much needed advice on how to lead such a huge group of people. In chapter 19, um, we, we see Israel at the base of Mount Sinai. We see God's presence on the mountain. Um, an incredible chapter to read through there. And then in chapter 20, you have the Ten Commandments. And in chapter 20, things kind of turn. And it, and it goes from really talking about what happens with Moses receiving not just the Ten Commandments, but the laws that were established in chapters 20 through 24, and then in chapter 25 through 31, you have the plans for the tent of meeting, all the furnishings that be in the tabernacle. And then you come to the end of chapter 31, verse 18, and it says this, And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Consider that for a moment, if you will. Written with the finger of God. Incredible. And for some time now, from chapters 20 to chapters 31, Moses has been on Mount Sinai. He's been, Sinai, he's been receiving all these instructions from the Lord. And all this time, 
The people of Israel have been waiting for him to come back, okay? Now, this wasn't like Moses saying, listen, I'm going to run to the store for 15 minutes and I'll be back. Moses didn't know how long he was going to be gone, all right? And I'm sure the people didn't expect that he was going to be gone for 40 days. And after a while, they begin to wonder what's going on with Moses. They didn't know. It says this in Exodus 24, 18. Moses entered the cloud, went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And they haven't gotten any word. For some reason, he didn't send a text message to let them know he was okay. Nothing. No smoke signals other than the Lord. But they haven't received any word from Moses. They have no idea how long he'd be gone. But Moses had left Aaron, his brother, there with the people to give him some guidance and direction. And Aaron does give them some guidance and direction, the wrong guidance and direction. Listen to what it says, Exodus 32. We're going to go quickly through um, some big chunks of this chapter. There's a lot that we could say about it, um, but we're going to move quickly. It says this, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Verse 2, so Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That's what the people were saying. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, verse 5, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. They rose up early the next day, offered the burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And it got out of hand quick. Now, like I said, there's a number of things that, that we could touch on. I just want to just point out a couple of things really quickly. First of all, going back to verse 1 and in verse 4, notice that the people are going right back to multiple gods, right? They've gone right back. They've reverted right back to what they saw in Egypt. For 430 years, they had been in Egypt. And they had watched the Egyptians worship multiple gods, Pharaoh himself being one of those gods, Right? And now they go back to this multiple gods mindset and they've already lost perspective of the one true God. I also want to point out that before Moses came on the scene, uh, they're engulfed in a culture that was very visual and hands, hands on. The, the kind of, of worship, the idea of worshiping a God that you couldn't see was a, a foreign concept. They, they couldn't imagine that. And so they fashioned idols in images in order to worship their gods. And this is exactly what we're seeing. Notice Aaron in verse 5 makes this worship not about multiple gods, but somehow he makes it right in his own mind that he makes it about worshiping the Lord. But Aaron knows enough that, that it has to be about the one true God, but he does here, what he does do wrongly is to incorporate uh, idol worship. You know, as you read through the Old Testament, you can't help but notice idol worship. When we think of idol worship, we think of like, of images, and, and, and we think of people bowing down to images and things like that. And, and it kind of doesn't register in our minds as well, although I think that there is some clear application that we could consider with that. But when we think of it here, as you read through the Old Testament, you notice really quickly that, that idol worship is a huge, huge problem. It, as you read through here, uh, it, it's really evident in, in the Exodus. As they go into the promised land, it's a huge problem there as well. As you go through Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, you notice that there's very rarely a king who doesn't get caught up in false worship and idol worship. In fact, even some of the kings that were good kings still got caught up. You, you'll read through the life of the kings and it'll say, but they didn't remove the Asherah. Or they didn't remove the images. They didn't remove the... They, they would do a lot of things right, but idol worship was a huge continual problem all the way through the Old Testament. Well, as you get through the end of that and as we consider all of this, you need to think about what's happening on the mountain, right? Think about what's going down on the bottom of the mountain. They've now fashioned this image and they're using it as, as idol worship. They've talked about worshiping multiple gods, and what's happening on top of the mountain is that the very finger of God, the first two commands that he's written down are no other gods and no idols. 
Exact opposite, right? Well, notice what it says in verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and worshipped it, sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and that I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. The Lord is angry because of their sin to the point where he's ready to be done with all of them. Moses, just get out of the way. Leave me alone so that I can do away with this people and then I'll make a great nation out of you. You ever stop to think about that from Moses' perspective? It would have been pretty easy to say, oh, okay, sounds good to me. But Moses is known as the meekest man to ever live. He doesn't even think about how God could make a great nation out of him. In fact, I would argue that he doesn't consider his own greatness. What he considers is the greatness and character of God. That's what we see in his response. Verse 11, Moses implored the Lord as God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power, with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he, did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains, to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. It's like, God, you, you don't want the Egyptians to think wrongly of you. And then he goes on and he says this, remember, not me, he's like, don't make it about me. He says, remember, key word, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give your to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. There's, there's so much that we could say with that. There's just so much. First, I think we have to recognize God hates sin. He hates it. Hates it. And then as well, the meekness of Moses throughout this text. We're going to see it here a little bit further. But remember, at this point, everything that Moses knows about what's going on at the bottom of the mountain is what the Lord has told him. He's about to see it firsthand. Verse 15 says that Moses turned, went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. Tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Talk about a valuable piece of artwork, right? Ever think about it like that? written by God himself. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands, broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned, with, burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Parents, this is where you turn to your kid and say, I'm not that hard. <laughs> I am not that bad of a parent, right? Moses is hot. He is, he's livid. But yet knowing his meekness, is one of his strengths. I, I really believe this is a righteous anger. I believe this is a righteous anger that comes from a man who is just in the presence of God. He's just had this incredible opportunity with the Lord. I'm sure that there's a sense in which he recognizes the holiness of the Lord and being with God. And now he comes down and sees this and he throws the tablets down, he breaks them, he takes the calf, he burns it, grounds it to powder, scatters it in the water, and makes the people drink it. You want your golden calf? You can have it. All of it. Drink every bit of it. I don't think he, he loses his mind. I think he's angry, angry because of sin, and he doesn't turn a blind eye to sin, eye to sin. and I want you to notice this. He doesn't turn a blind eye to the sin of his brother, I think Moses probably in that moment could have been like, Aaron, you better go hide. Let me deal with this. 
But he doesn't do that. He doesn't protect his brother. He lovingly confronts his brother. And that's exactly what has to happen when sin is in the camp. Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any, of, uh, any, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. Pretty sure Aaron was the first guy that also said his dog ate his homework. Right? I'm like, come on, dude. Like that's, you threw it in there and out came this calf. You know, notice what Aaron does here. He, he does quote what the people said but then he kind of spins it to his advantage and tries to be like, it wasn't me. I really, I don't have no idea. Just screw it and out comes this calf. Not only does he play the blame game, it was those evil people, but he also acts as if he only threw it in the fire and out comes. There's a serious lack of leadership and responsibility. Ownership, Right? Verse 25 says, when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him, and from there it gets really ugly and really sad. He said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel. I want you to recognize that. This isn't Moses acting out of His personal anger. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. Imagine that, ordained for the service of the Lord at the cost of the lives of their people. (coughs) Moses saw that they were willing to deal with sin. Now, I think at this point, you, you, you kind of have a decision to make. And if you're someone who doesn't know much about the Bible, doesn't know much about the Lord, you, you kind of have to make a decision. You can either think that God is mean, 3,000 people, that, really, because they made a gold calf, 3,000 people got to die. It gets worse, actually, if you look at the last verse of that chapter, it says this. It says that then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they had made the calf the one that Aaron made. So you either got to think... Either God is, is, is mean or God's really serious about sin. And I think it's very clear that God is serious about sin. He, he takes it very seriously. And those in this text who, to, who took sin lightly, they died. Listen, we, we have to take sin serious. We can't blame others like Aaron. We can't make up ridiculous stories. We need to own up to our sin and we need to deal with it. Verse 30 says, The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now... If you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. What an incredible statement for Moses to make. Clearly, he loved the people. But the Lord said to Moses, whoever sinned against me, I'll blot out out of my book. Verse 34 says, but now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. God takes sin seriously. You know, as, as I've thought about this, this passage and as it went through my mind, I, I couldn't get past that word perhaps. 
perhaps I can make atonement for you. Because you can't help but look at this story and, and recognize a picture of Christ atoning for our sin. But, but the, the big difference is this. The atonement of Christ is not a perhaps. It's an it is finished. Christ died for our sin and the atonement of sin with the death of Christ was completely sufficient to pay for our sin. I don't know if you know what the word atonement means. I want to give you this uh, definition from the uh, Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. I think it's really good. It says this, the act by which God and man are brought together in personal relationship. It only happens through Jesus Christ, okay? Only way. The term is derived from Anglo-Saxon words meaning making at one, hence at one meant atonement. You ever recognize that about the word atonement? At one meant you could break it down. It presupposes a separation or alienation that needs to be overcome if human beings are to know God and have fellowship with Him. As a term expressing relationship, atonement is tied closely to such terms as reconciliation and forgiveness. Atonement only happens through Jesus Christ. That's why we sang there's power in the blood. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way you can be at one with God is through the atonement of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament uses the word atonement a, a, a lot. In fact, if you were to read through Leviticus, it's in, it's in there a lot. As you go into the New Testament, it's only one time that it's in the New Testament and it's only if you have uh, King James and it's in this passage in Romans chapter 5. It says this. And remember, remember what that definition says there. It talks about how the New Testament uses words such as reconciliation and forgiveness. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified, we've been declared righteous by his blood, by the blood of Christ, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation or atonement. It only happens through Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to clearly understand that the penalty for sin is death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin, the penalty, the earnings for your sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only way you can be reconciled is through God. And, and the reality is we're all sinners. Every single one of us. Nicest person in the world, sinner. Sinner. And we all need to be reconciled to God. And the only way that happens is through Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, God made him, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The only way you can have a relationship with God, the only way you can deal with your sin is through Jesus Christ. And to understand that his death on the cross was to pay for that sin. And so you need to place saving faith. We talked about this last week, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace, through faith, you're saved. Well, as you read Exodus 32, it might be easiest, easy for us to think, what happened? What happened? How did the wheels fall off so quickly, right? What, what took place? How in the world did they go from, from the plagues in, in, in Passover and crossing the Red Sea to Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days and at the end of that, things just fall apart entirely. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Psalm 106, and I would encourage you to read through Psalm 106. There's, there's a lot there that kind of takes and condense, condenses what took place in Exodus. It says this in verse 19. They made a calf in Horeb and exchanged a metal Im and, and, and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, 
wondrous works in the land of Ham and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before them to turn away his wrath from destroying them. A beautiful picture of what was to come with Christ. That he would stand in the breach for us to pay for our sin. But I want you to notice what took place with Israel. You might ask that question, what happened? How did they get there? Well, verse 21, they forgot God their Savior. They forgot. And in our minds, we think like, seriously, how do you forget the Red Sea? Like, come on, man. How do you forget the Passover? How'd you forget that when you you put the blood over your door and sacrificed the lamb and had that Passover meal and How'd you forget how you plundered the Egyptians as you left? You didn't even have to do anything. They just gave it to you. How'd you forget all of that? They forgot God their Savior. You know, it's really interesting if you compare in Deuteronomy chapter 5, they had once again be given the Ten Commandments because Moses had taken, smashed them, right? Threw them down. And right, just saying, you're smashes them on the ground. Well, in Deuteronomy 5, they'd once again be given the Ten Commandments, and the laws are spelled out for them. And then in the very next chapter, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you have the Shema. We've talked a lot about the Shema in the, in the past, and I don't have time to go into it in great te- detail, but it's a prayer that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that often serves as a centerpiece of, of morning and evening prayers for Jews, okay? It's something that they all have memorized. And if you've ever had the opportunity to, to go to Israel, you see the, the, the Shema really lived out, especially if you go to the Western Wall in Jerusalem. But I want you to catch this prayer, okay? In light of the fact that they forgot God, their Savior, and now they've been given the commands a second time, listen to what it says in the very next chapter after they get the commands a second time. It says this, hear. Now that word hear means to not just hear audibly, but it means to obey as well. It's a, it's a do. Hear it and do it. Obey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And then he goes on to describe further. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise so you don't forget. That's what it's about. You've got to remember these. Don't forget them. This is the second time we've had to go through this. Remember them. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Verse 12, take, then take care lest you forget the Lord. That's why they had to do it. Don't forget. You need to do this. Take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Don't forget where you've come from. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Take care lest you forget. Remember who brought you out of slavery. Remember who rescued you. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, might. And teach this diligently to your children. Listen, if I, if I could summarize this whole message in just a couple of phrases, it's this. Don't forget, be diligent to remember. And you have to be diligent to remember. You know, maybe you're someone who can just rattle off, uh, you know, your address from when you were a kid. Or your phone number from when you grew up, right? Right? But a lot of things, if you aren't diligent with them, you forget them. And the whole point of this here as you come to Deuteronomy chapter 6 is like, don't forget where you came from. You came out of the house of slaves. You were slaves. Don't forget about slavery. Don't forget about the plagues. Don't forget about the Red Sea. Don't forget. But remember what God has done for you. Remember where he has brought you from. Don't forget. Be diligent to remember. You know, as I thought about this story of the golden calf, it's pretty easy for us to look at these and say, like, seriously, how did they forget that? But I'm not sure we're all that different. We would say we only worship one God, and we do. 
But I really believe that our world is in love with the God of self. We think that we don't need an idol for worship, and we don't. But we've created idols with methodology of worship, with Bible versions, and a whole list of things that we could come up with. And most certainly, as we look at our nation, we can't help but see that we are clearly a nation that has forgotten God. I mentioned where things have gone in the last 20 years since 9-11. But to back it up even further, we really are no longer a nation, one nation under God. Our motto may still on paper be, in God we trust, but we seem to have forgotten that a long time ago, and I think that's going to disappear. Meekness is rarely ever seen in any leader, especially politicians. Rather, most leaders and politicians are grasping for power and control. And as we see our world and our nation crumbling around us, We need to see that the problem is that we are caught up in sin. And we've forgotten God. You can boil it all down to that. You can be frustrated with everything that's going on, and we all are. But the problem is sin, and the problem is we've forgotten God. We've forgotten the principles upon which this nation was founded came from this book. We've forgotten that the source of laws was not found in the words of man, but in the Word of God. And as I look at Israel and the wanderings, I can't help but see our nation and the world. And it's pretty discouraging. And I could leave you on a down note, but I'm not going to do that to you. See, as Israel wandered in Exodus and through Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, just about everybody died off. But there was a few who saw the promised land. As you think and as you go through the Old Testament and you go through the kings and and as you read into the prophets, the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed They end up back in captivity, but there's a remnant. There's a remnant that's left there. And as we think about all that's going on in our world and all that's going on in our nation, we need to be reminded and we need to remember that our hope is not in politicians, it's not in government, it's in Jesus Christ. He is our living hope, Peter says. Like the song says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, right? Life is worth living just because he lives. So church, may we as the bride of Christ look forward to the return of Jesus. We're the bride waiting for the groom. May we look forward to his return. May we be prepared for it. Let's love the Lord with all of our heart and our soul and our might, no matter what's going on around us. Let's diligently teach our children and our grandchildren the word of God. Let's diligently teach them about what this book has to say as we sit in our homes, as we walk, as we're in our vehicles, when we get up in the morning, when we go to bed, let's talk about it. Let's diligently teach the generations to come the truth of the Word of God. Let's have God's Word posted throughout our homes and in every aspect of our lives. 
I obviously could go down a huge illustration in regards to posting things, right? How about posting God's Word? Let's have God's Word posted in every aspect of our lives. Let's know it. Let's live it out. Let's be intentional so that everyone knows that we're followers of Jesus Christ and that He is our Lord. Listen, we can look at these stories and say, how in the world did they do it? Or we can look at these stories and say, God, don't let that ha happen to me. Help me to be diligent to remember. Help me to be diligent to remember the sacrifice of your son. Help me to be diligent to remember the hope that we have. Help me to be diligent to remember the promises and the truths in your word. Help me to be diligent to remember that you don't give us a spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind. Help me to be diligent, God, to remember. It takes intentionality. It's not just going to happen. Don't forget. Be diligent to remember. God, as we come before you today, we're thankful for the hope of heaven that this is not our home, that we're just passing through. We're just here in a pit stop of sorts. And yet, God, I pray that as you have us here, that we would be mindful to remember why you have us here, to make passionate followers of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help us to remember, to share the hope that we have, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, as we come before you today, we admit and we recognize and we say, God, forgive us as a nation. We have certainly sinned before you. We have forgotten you. We have forgotten what happened 200 years plus years ago when this nation was founded. We have forgotten the principles upon which it was founded. We have forgotten the truths of your word. We have forgotten that we placed our trust in you. We have forgotten. God, forgive us. And as we see sin running rampant around us, help us to be bold enough to say something about it. Help us to not be content with it. Help us to have the righteous anger of one like Moses. Help us to be willing to say, that's not all right. That's not okay. And God, help us to be diligent within our own lives, in our own homes. You know, for many, they're concerned about what generations to follow might have to live with and deal with. And God, if we don't prepare them, it's on us. Lord, help us to be diligent to teach our children and grandchildren what they need to know, what they need to hear. Help us to be diligent to speak with our neighbor, our coworker, our classmates, to offer the hope that is freely given through Jesus Christ. God, we come today, we remember. We remember what you've done. And we say thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.